Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Oregon Employment Department for our weekly media briefing. A couple of quick reminders before we get started. This call is being recorded, and links to the recording will be sent out to those who RSVP'd after the briefing. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the briefing, and you will be called on to ask your questions in the order you RSVP to the event. Now, I'd like to turn it over to David Gerstenfeld, Acting Director of the Oregon Employment Department. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I have more information to share on recent federal guidance that has changes regarding the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program and other updates on unemployment benefits. But first, I'd like to start out with an economic update. Yesterday, the Employment Department released our monthly snapshot of Oregon's economy. In January, Oregon added 8,300 jobs, and the unemployment rate was essentially unchanged at 6.2%. This is a welcome increase in jobs from the large losses we saw in December. It's also very heartening to see that the industry's hardest hit with job losses over the past year saw the largest monthly gains in January. Even with those gains in leisure and hospitality, from December 2019 through December 2020, this industry lost 25 years worth of job gains. This is one example of how deep the disparate impacts are from the pandemic recession and how lower wage earners have really been hit hard. One in five jobs in the leisure and hospitality sector pays minimum wage in Oregon. In this sector, it still has the greatest job losses of any in the state. Although transportation, warehousing and utilities dropped about a thousand jobs in January following a surge over the holidays, this broad sector is the only one with employment above its level of one year ago. It's increased by about 4,100 jobs or 5.6% over the past year. By January of 2021, Oregon has regained 42% of the jobs lost in the spring of 2020. This reflects real good news for Oregon's economy, but there's a lot of healing left to do. The pandemic continues to constrain some workers. Between May and December of 2020, about 62,000 Oregonians in any month indicated they were prevented for, from participating in the labor force because of the pandemic. We estimate if they had not been prevented by the pandemic from seeking work, the state's labor force participation rate would have been about 1.8 percentage points higher on average. Oregon's labor force participation rate in 2020 was the lowest on record going all the way back to 1976. For more detailed information about the state of our economy, please visit our equalityinfo.org website. Transitioning to talking about benefit programs, we're very pleased to see the federal benefit extensions moving through Congress. The American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 was passed by the Senate and today by the House. We hope to see it signed by the President this week to minimize any delays for people receiving PUA or PEUC benefits. We know that any disruption in benefits can be a real hardship. We're prioritized getting these changes implemented as quickly and smoothly as we can and are doing all of the preparation we can for this legislation. The bill still has to be signed by the president before it's a law, and we will need official guidance from the US Department of Labor about their requirements for these federal programs. As we receive more information and guidance from the Department of Labor about any past legislation, and can confidently provide rough estimates for when we expect to begin paying these benefits, we will share that information. Based on what we know now, we are currently planning to implement the program changes in this priority order. First will be the FPUC extension because this program helps the most people. Everyone who will receive at least $1 in benefits on any benefit program will be eligible to receive an additional $300 weekly benefit under the new legislation. Next will be PUA, which will be fully retroactive and will provide relief for those who have already exhausted all of their benefits. Third will be the PEUC benefit extension program. As with prior extensions, we're looking for ways to provide help as quickly as we can to as many people as possible. For example, we are hoping to find ways to allow people on PEUC with a remaining balance on their claim to continue receiving benefits without interruption. Since the MEUC program impacts a smaller number of people, we will shift our attention back to building that new program once FPUC, PUA, and PEUC program extensions are up and running. 
As a reminder, anybody who is eligible for MEUC will already be receiving their base underlying unemployment benefits and the FPUC benefits. We'll also then return our attention to the approximately 6,000 people who had their claims manually moved and are waiting for uh, up to two weeks of FPUC benefits. Because these weeks of benefits were manually moved from one benefit program to another to avoid being considered overpayments, some additional manual and technical work is required to process the FPUC payments that should be issued for those weeks. These people will not lose out on the benefits they are eligible for. Anybody who is still waiting for their two weeks of FPUC payments does not need to call and they should just keep continue claiming. For now, until we have more information to share about when we can expect to begin issuing payments under the American Rescue Act program changes, people should take these steps to make it easier for us to process their claims. For people seeking PUA benefits, they should keep filing their benefits every week, even if their PUA claim is exhausted or has a zero balance. Claimants who have exhausted their regular UI or PEUC claims will need to file a new claim so we can determine if they are eligible to receive benefits under a new claim. To stay informed of program changes and other information related to the American Rescue Act, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our weekly email updates in English or Spanish. When you're at our website, you can go to our quick links and click on the sign up for email updates section. If you have specific questions about the new legislation, please do not call us but instead visit our website at unemployment.organ.gov, which we update almost daily. You can also send us a message through our contact us form at unemployment.organ.gov slash contact us. When the pandemic struck, the employment department created some temporary rules to allow us to pay benefits to as many people as possible. Later, the standards in those rules were made more permanent for the duration of the pandemic. Because of those rules, as I mentioned last week, we have already been paying PUA benefits in many situations that are now required to be paid under the US Department of Labor's February 25th, 2021 guidance. We have been paying PUA benefits to people who refuse to work under conditions that violate required COVID-19 safety measures, such as wearing masks and social distancing paying benefits to people who had a reduction of hours or a temporary or permanent layoff. Of note here is that earlier in February 2021, the Department of Labor informed us that we needed to stop paying benefits in these cases, but the more recent February 25th guidance means we can go back to paying those benefits. Claimants who were affected by this change will be able to claim any weeks of benefits that they missed during the time the question was changed in that February timeframe. We have also been paying benefits to school employees during break periods if they were unable to continue working a non-educational job due to COVID-19 reasons and allowing people receiving PUA to select more than one COVID-19 related reason on their certification form and to change or update their COVID-19 impact reasons each week. There are a few requirements from the new guidance that we are working to program. Under that new guidance, we can pay benefits to school employees who are unemployed or have had their hours reduced as a result of COVID-19. This includes if there are changes in their work schedules and if there are partial closures. We'll be notifying anybody who is denied PUA benefits and might now be eligible under these new standards. There are also changes to how we will certify claimants information to protect people from identity theft and to prevent fraud. Some people may receive an email from our technology partner, ID.me, directing them to verify their identity online. It's important for people to know that they only need to complete that online verification through ID.me if they receive an email from us with a link to ID.me. People shouldn't share the link or try to go through that process unless they receive an email from the Oregon Employment Department requiring them to do so. Otherwise, it could delay payments and PUA claims can be backdated as far as February 2nd, 2020 for the initial claims that were filed on or before December 27th of last year, and as far back as December 6th, 2020 for initial claims that were filed December 28th of last year or later. We previously shared some information about a phase out period for some people on PUA and PEUC 
that would have allowed them to continue receiving benefits beyond the March 13th expiration date that would otherwise apply. If the American Rescue Plan Act is signed into law, it will get rid of that phase out period approach and it will have both PUA and PEUC benefits extended through September 4th. We continue finding scammers online posing as the Oregon Employment Department on social media and emails and sometimes over text messages. To help Oregonians understand what the scammers do and say, we've posted some examples on social media and have shared in our weekly email update sent to more than 100,000 people. We want to make sure people seeking benefits stay away from social media accounts falsely claiming to be the U.S. Department of Labor or the Oregon Employment Department or our representatives or of emails or text messages that they might receive from fraudsters claiming to be us. People should be wary of website addresses or email addresses that do not end in .gov. Government agency emails or websites will end in .gov, like Oregon.gov. For example, if you see a dol-gov.com, this could be a scam. If there are links in an email, hover over the link to see if the URL it will send you to is real or if it's suspicious. Do not click on anything suspicious. If you see messages or posts on social media, here's how you can help protect yourself from being scammed. Check the name of the account for any spelling errors or letters that have been replaced by numbers, a zero instead of an O, for example. Check that the Twitter handle is correct. Ours for the Oregon Employment Department is capital O, capital R, lowercase employment. Check how many likes and followers the Facebook page has. The official OED Facebook page has more than 11,000 likes right now. And check that the correct street address and website are listed on the about page of the account. Be cautious if somebody private messages you on social media and offers to help. The Oregon Employment Department will never initiate a private message with you. Criminals are pretending to be government employees and direct messaging people. We will never ask for money in exchange for people to receive their benefits, and we will never ask people for their PIN. If somebody shares a link, make sure it has a .gov at the end, and if you're at all uncertain, just don't click on it. The best and safest way to contact us is through our Contact Us form. And we do ask people if they see scam attempts on social media to help us by reporting the post as a scam attempt. We have rescheduled our next unemployment webinar to Thursday, March 18th at 1 p.m. And we'll be discussing the new guidance regarding federal benefits legislation, the phase out period for PUA and PUC, and the PUA benefit expansions through the recent US Department of Labor guidance changes. Simultaneous interpretation will be available in Spanish, Vietnamese, Russian, and in Cantonese. To register for this webinar and to view all of the past ones, you can visit unemployment.oregon.gov slash webinars. And sharing some numbers regarding the benefits that we've provided from March 15th of 2020 through March 9th of 2021, we paid $8 billion in benefits to more than 565,000 people. That covers more than 11 and a half million weeks of benefits. Last week alone, we paid about $145 million to about 181,000 people. The total benefits that we paid includes $660 million in PUA benefits to over 101,000 people. And it's been one year now since the pan pandemic upended hundreds of thousands of Oregonians' lives and livelihoods. As the last year has shown, unemployment benefits are a critical lifeline for so many of our neighbors. Along with making federally required changes to the PUA program based on recent guidance, we're turning our attention to implementing the program extensions and other changes that may be enacted into law. I'd like to thank our employees for their dedication to making sure as many people as possible can receive their benefits as quickly as possible. We know that unfortunately, some people will see a disruption in their benefits and we remain focused on minimizing the disruption people are likely to see now and before the next federal extensions can be funded. And with that, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that people have. Now we are opening the lines to members of the media to ask questions. We will call on you in the order you RSVP'd. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. If you're joining us by phone, be sure to hit star six to unmute yourself. Anyone experiencing technical difficulties or unable to ask their questions, 
and send an email to OED underscore communications at oregon.gov. And the first person to ask a question is Keaton Thomas with KATU. So, hey, hello. First of all, uh, one of the obvious questions is, you know, currently, what is your best estimate for the delay that people on PEUC, PUA might find as you try and implement some of the changes under the stimulus bill? So we don't have a real good idea yet. It still hasn't been actually uh, formally become a law. It still needs to be signed by the president. We haven't received the guidance. We're already working on it and have been throughout the week looking at the requirements that are in the bill and starting to do the work necessary to implement the changes, but we don't yet have a, a solid estimate of when the different pieces of those programs can start to be rolled out. As soon as we do have that information, that's something we certainly intend to share with you uh, through our social media and on our webpage. And in a similar vein, um, what's going to be the most complicated portion of this for you guys to implement? I mean, I know you've talked about changes in the past. When I think about a change we got from 400 to 300 per week, you know, what is the most complicated portion for you guys here? And part of that will depend a little bit on what guidance we get from the Department of Labor. From what we've seen so far, um, the potentially most complicated might be adding the additional weeks of eligibility for people that are on PUA. It, as the last extension did, this bill both extends the time period that people can receive PUA benefits and adds additional weeks of benefits. The way that program has evolved over time, especially with us being on extended benefits and high extended benefits at different times, um, depending on the guidance we get from the Department of Labor, it may require a significant amount of manual work to make individual adjustments to how many weeks of benefits people are getting. So we're waiting anxiously for that clarification, which will help us know if that will be one of the more challenging parts. The PEUC program also, um, I believe that we're up to kind of layer seven of PEUC uh, based on all the different combinations of ways people can be on that program. So that is a little more complex. The good news is that a lot of the changes made in this bill were comparatively straightforward and we didn't see things that are as challenging as creating brand new benefit programs. Thank you. And now Peter Wong with Pamplin Media. Hi, David. Uh, on MEUC, which is now the lowest of the four priorities you outlined, that only applies to the period between the December extension and March 13. They didn't, it wasn't included as a extension in this particular bill. That's our understanding is yeah. that it looks like the MEUC program was not extended. Okay. So it will only, anybody who uh, qualify for that would have to wait till uh, all the other changes uh, you outlined are complete it. Right. And we're doing that again, focused on really getting the most help to the most people um, and not minimizing the impact that this will have. We know that every every dollar of benefits the person is eligible for, we want to get to them as quickly as possible, but we're really prioritizing getting the most people, the most assistance as quickly as we can. Okay. Well, quickly, uh, you mentioned the hospital, leisure and hospitality sector losing the most jobs and so on coming back. Uh, building on your answers to uh, your agency's uh, efforts to help people find jobs, do uh, you know if the, the, the sectors are the ones that uh, are most in demand or heavily in demand now for employment or reemployment? Uh, well, so I don't have the hard data in front of me regarding the most in demand jobs, and, and that's certainly a quickly shifting area. As different parts of the state are um, having restrictions ease or tighten down a little bit as the pandemic uh, impact in local areas changes, we're certainly seeing uh, as businesses open up more, they have increased need to, to call people back for more hours or to call more employees back or to hire new workers. And we anticipate that uh, continuing to increase as the vaccinations continue and businesses are able to reopen more. So we do see that being an ongoing area of high growth for employment. Okay, thank you. Next is Rob Manning with OPB. 
Um, my question is about the provision in the uh, this bill that uh, President Biden's expected to sign on Friday um, that would exempt the first ten thousand dollars in unemployment benefits from federal taxes. And I'm wondering about Oregonians who had taxes withheld and how exactly those people are going to get that money that is no longer taxable uh, back. That's something that we don't have answers on yet. Uh, one possible outcome is the money that we withhold for people is the same as money that's withheld, for instance, from a paycheck for taxes. And when we withhold that money, we send it to the IRS for federal taxes or to the Oregon Department of Revenue for state taxes. Once we've made that payment, we've made that payment on account of that person. And we don't have the ability to take that money back from those taxing entities. Uh, if it ends up that this change means that they have a lower a tax obligation, then they either would owe less when they file their taxes or be entitled to a refund. So, so that's one possible way that it will play out, but um, we haven't received any guidance on that. And uh, it'll probably take some time after it actually becomes law before we get guidance from the US Department of Labor or before the Internal Revenue Service issues any guidance on how they will be handling that federal tax matter. That's really within their, their sphere of control. Okay. And I guess kind of uh, leads to the question of what about Oregon's own state income taxes and whether or not those are, you know, might become no longer taxable as well. Is that something that you're aware of conversations in the legislature? Or is that something that OED could do on its own? Or where might that stand? So the employment department, we do not have the authority to change whether benefits that we pay is considered taxable under either federal or state income tax laws that would require legislation. Um, I think that there probably are some legislators that are looking at this idea. We haven't seen an introduced bill that, that talks about that. And again, that's really our role in that um, is just to help educate people about the potential impact on their federal or state tax liability and to do what we can to help people have withholdings if they wish to have withholdings made. All right, thank you. So next is Dick Hughes with the Hughesisms. Thank you very much for doing these. As always, they're very helpful. Uh, I have two sort of background questions. Um, the first is, I understand what you're saying about don't call the department, but there is a significant segment of the Oregon population that's uncomfortable with online. And you have so much information on the website, it, it can be overwhelming to people. So what are those people, what are they supposed to do? So the, the best way, if there really is a specific question that they have about their claim, that contact us form is the best way for them to tell us they need some help and to give us a general idea of what the issue is. And then we have people that are addressing the issues calling them back to talk to them and, and work through their claim with them. Uh, there is a whole lot of information. We've had so many different claims and different programs that have been created over the course of the past year and circumstances change. So we're trying to provide as much information as possible. And there is a lot of it. There's a good search feature on our website. Uh, we did implement the, um, the chat bot that is another way to help people access some of the information that's on there. Uh, so we really are encouraging people to call in only if they have to contact us uh, to get their payments made because there's no other way, uh, you know, they have to have a conversation with someone um, or for people that don't have any access to the internet. We wanna make sure that the phone lines are um, as open and accessible for those people as possible. Thank you. Um, then. As far as the Department of Labor, and I understand that you wait for have to wait for guidance, but can you explain for the lay person out there why you have to wait for that guidance? Um, that you you can't just take what Congress did and the president signs and say now we're ready to roll. Sure, for, for I think there's two different reasons. One is that these federally created programs like FPUC, PUA, PUC, these are not like the regular unemployment insurance program where there's some layer of federal 
requirements, but states have quite a bit of leeway to create their own program in state law. And we've seen some adjustments to state law to our state unemployment insurance program during the course of the pandemic. These federal programs are just that. They're federal programs that states are essentially operating under contract with the federal government. So we're required to operate them as the federal government directs us to. So we need to make sure that we're doing that. If we don't, it could mean that the agreement we have with the federal government would be canceled and those benefit programs would no longer be available to people in Oregon. Besides that, um, the statutes do set out sometimes with a lot of specificity how the programs play out, but there's also a lot of details and a lot of uh, other issues that aren't directly answered by the statutes. And those require more clarification before states can know exactly how to implement parts of the programs. All of that being said, we communicate regularly with the US Department of Labor and with other states about these programs. We generally can get a good sense of where the areas that are likely to get more clarification or interpretation are. And we've already been working this week to look at how to implement the programs and do the work to get that started. So it, it's true that we can't have all of these programs fully up and running without having that federal guidance, but we're not waiting for that guidance to start the implementation. We're working on the parts that we feel confident of right now. Thank you very much for that helpful explanation. Next is Mike Rogaway with your. Hey, David. Um, two questions. First off, do you have a ballpark idea of how many people are likely to experience some disruption uh, in benefits? Uh, as the new bill is implemented? Are we talking PUA plus PUC plus something else? Uh, what, what would you say? So it, it would be an incredibly rough estimate. And when we look at the number of people who were facing running out of benefits, if the, uh, the new legislation isn't signed into law, it's about 133,000 people. And, and that's those people are the ones that are on PUA and PEUC. Uh, depending on how quickly we can get the programs implemented, there will be additional people that are running out of regular benefits that would be going on to one of those programs. Uh, but that, that's hopefully a very worst case scenario. We're doing everything that we can as we did with the last set of laws to try to get at least large groups of people, for instance, those who have a remaining balance on their claim, to be able to keep claiming. Until we get into the work a little bit more, we won't have an estimate of when we can get those pieces of work done. So it's really hard to give a, a solid estimate of how many people we think might end up with disrupted payments. But our focus right now is really getting that number as low as possible and shortening that period of delay as much as possible. Good. Okay. And second question to come back to the um, the tax implications. My assumption is um, just like with the stimulus payments, that if people are reducing their federal tax liability, uh, that reduces their federal tax subtraction and increases their Oregon taxes. So a portion of their forgiven federal tax liability would be given back in the form of increased Oregon tax liabilities. Is to, is that right? I'm really not comfortable answering that because I've been spending a lot of time focusing on the intricacies of all of our benefit programs. But I think that's a question that really the Oregon Department of Revenue would need to look at as to how the laws that they administer play out with interacting with the federal counterparts. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next is Bill Poehler from the Statesman Journal. Hey, David. Um, so as far as uh, I've, I've I've, I've talked I've, I've talked to a couple of people now who they have never applied for unemployment and they're getting letters from the department now and they don't really know what to do with them. Um, you know, with your phone phone lines jammed up and, and a number of these are older people, where do where do we direct them to to say, OK, here's where you can actually get help? The, the best way we have multiple ways on our website for people to let us know Th those are possible signs that their identity was stolen at some point and that people may be trying to file a fraudulent claim for benefits using their stolen identity. So we do want to know right away, uh, if you go to unemployment.organ.gov and search for um, fraud, we, we have a pretty easy to fill out form that people can give us their information. Um, if, 
they, they can try calling us. Um, again, we're discouraging that unless it's something that is absolutely necessary to, to leave the lines open for people that do have to speak to someone. They also, um, as kind of a, a last case, they, they can mail documents to us uh, with some information on there, but that contact us form is really the quickest way for us to get that. And then if we need to do additional follow-up, we reach out to them to get additional information. Okay, um, so maybe I'll have her mail it. Uh, so with, I, I know you guys have been hesitant to talk about fraud or is, it sounds like like that one is is one that I, I've, I've kind of heard of and I've heard of a couple other examples. Are this, are you seeing things in this state that other states haven't been seeing? Or are we seeing, can you can you talk about what what types of frauds? I, not, I just the general, like, I, it sounds like most of these are something like this that this state has seen and other states haven't, I don't know. Sure, I, I can give some real general information. Um, we, there's always, unfortunately, some people that are trying to commit fraud to receive benefits that they're not entitled to. And this might be an individual um, getting a new job, having a paycheck coming in, and then when they file their claim, telling us that they're not back at work and haven't earned anything. Um, that's something that, that the unemployment system in Oregon and every state sees all the time and, and has systems in place to look for and to try to uh, catch quickly and, and take care of. The larger threats that, that all states have been seeing during this pandemic have been more of the organized fraud schemes. We are seeing the same types of schemes in Oregon that other states are seeing. Um, and we're working, we communicate very closely with other states a lot of them are like the types of things that you were talking where there is some ID theft involved. And frequently this could be, uh, you know, over the, the past many years, there have been all kinds of news reports about uh, data breaches at, at all kinds of entities where identities and personal information has been stolen. And that information criminal rings by, and then they use to file uh, fake uh, claims for benefits. So one of the indicators that, that we really want people to be alert for is exactly what you described, getting a letter saying that they applied for benefits when they didn't, if they received the 1099-G form from us saying that they received benefits last year and they didn't or they didn't apply for benefits. Uh, those are things that we want to know about so that we can work with our law enforcement partners to catch the people that are doing this and um, make sure that the benefits are there to be accessed quickly when people really do need them. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Next is Tom Cusack with the Oregon Housing Blog. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hey, David, can you hear me back yet? I can hear you. You cut out a little bit, but I, I think I can hear your question. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on the question about the unemployment compensation exemption from federal tax. I, I sort of dug into some details today that I long since forgotten. And apparently back in 2009, there was a similar measure with the prior recovery act that exempted something like $2,400 from income tax at the federal level. Oregon turned around and did the same thing at the state level and buried in some of the reports, it talks about a uh, tax savings on the Oregon taxes of something like $32 million for those people who benefited from that. My question is, I recall that you recently provided some information to me about the number of people who you had sent some uh, IRS forms to the 1099G. And I'm wondering what percentage of the people who got that form uh, would have had uh, benefits of more than 10,200 in, in 2020? I don't have that information available. I, I think as we get more of the pieces of the new legislation um, anticipated law implemented that we have direct control over. We'll certainly be looking at those things to try to provide more data. Uh, I think that's something that certainly our State Department of Revenue and people looking at state revenues will likely be interested in. But right now we haven't had a chance to really look at that yet. And just to follow up, I think someone asked this question earlier you're not aware of any specific legislation that's come forward that would incorporate the change in the uh, unemployment compensation 
exemption into some existing legislation. Is that right? That's correct. We, we know that some legislators are interested in looking at the idea, but we haven't seen any bill yet. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Next is Lindsay Nadwish with COIN. Hi, David. Um, I was hoping you could explain, so for people like on PUA or I guess UI too, who have already exhausted all their benefits, they don't have any benefits right now. Are they out these weeks regardless or can they get paid retroactively once these programs are extended or are they kind of out of luck because the extension doesn't start until maybe later? Can you just explain that for folks? Sure, and I think you're asking about people who maybe like um, within the past couple of weeks used up their benefits. Uh, so for instance, used up all of their PUA benefits and didn't have any, and now there's the new program that hopefully will become law um, this week. Uh, again, that, that's one of the areas where we'll want confirmation from federal guidance. Initial looks make it appear that they um, likely would be able to receive the additional weeks of benefits. So that's one of the reasons why we've been encouraging people to keep claiming, even if they're, it looks like they've used up all of their benefits in case that retroactivity is possible. So we, we think that it's likely, and we certainly hope that that's the case, but we'll need to get that final confirmation from the U.S. Department of Labor on that. And do you have any idea how soon they might tell you that so you can kind of get rolling? I don't. Um, again, it, it isn't actually a law yet, so I know that they're watching it uh, just as we are very closely, and they've been... Um, Typically, we've been getting at least some initial guidance within about a week of it becoming law. And as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're not waiting for that to start our work to implement the program. Uh, and we, we hope that we're able to not have anything be held up by waiting for that guidance, but we really don't know how quickly they'll be able to get that to us. On some of the more technical pieces, it does get more complex, especially if they're looking at how it plays out across all the states. And there are some questions where we've been waiting um, quite a few weeks to get a concrete definitive answer. Uh, and lastly, do you know, does that $10,000 tax exemption, does that apply to people who got benefits through work share? The, the work share benefits are treated the same as unemployment benefits. So I haven't looked at that language specifically um, regarding the work share benefits, but um, I would assume that it likely does cover the work share benefits as well. Thank you. Oh, sorry, lastly, and it's September 4th that it extended it through, right? For benefit programs? Correct. The, the law talks about September 6th, but because it's a weekly benefit program, the last time period that would be covered would be September 4th of 2021. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions today. This call was recorded and we will send links to the recordings to everyone who RSVP'd and we will post it on our website this afternoon. Thank you for participating today and for everything you are doing to keep Oregonians informed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.